Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Mark Nelson, president of Westmont's chapter of the Honor Society Phi Kappa Phi, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this event and to introduce our speakers. Today's event is part of the Paul C. Wilt Phi Kappa Phi lecture series. This series was founded to honor longtime member of the Westmont History Department, Paul Wilt, and to showcase some of our finest academic work twice a year for a general audience. Our main speaker this afternoon is Guang Song, professor of computer science here at Westmont. Professor Song earned a BS in physics from Jilin University in China, an MA in physics, and a PhD in computer science from Texas A&M. He won a postdoc at Iowa State University, where he later joined the faculty and taught for 16 years before coming to Westmont in 2022. He is a specialist in computational biology, where his background in physics has equipped him almost uniquely to apply computational techniques to understanding the physical structure of complex molecules, such as proteins. He has supervised numerous graduate students, published dozens, nay, scores, of research articles in high-level journals such as Physical Biology, Proteins, Journal of Computational Biology, and PLOS One. He received a major grant from the NSF. To quote Ron Burgundy, he's kind of a big deal, though he is so modest and unassuming that you would never know it to talk to him. At Westmont, he's become the backbone of the computer science major, and we are fortunate to have him. A distinctive feature of the Wilt Lecture Series is that, in addition to the main speaker, two commentators from the faculty are also selected, one from inside the speaker's department and one from outside. A commentator is supposed to be someone who combines scholarly excellence, a mature understanding of the liberal arts, and proven ability to communicate with the general audience. It was no surprise then that Professor Song invited Russ Howell from our Department of Mathematics and Computer Science to serve as a commentator. On the other hand, he also invited me. <laughs> Professor Howell earned the BA from Wheaton College, a master's degree from Edinburgh University in Scotland, and a PhD from The Ohio State University. He's taught at Westmont since 1978, and now holds the Kathleen Smith Endowed Chair of Mathematics. I earned my BA from Wheaton College as well, and my MA and PhD from the University of Notre Dame, and joined Westmont in 2006. Professor Song will speak for approximately 45 minutes. Then we will have brief comments from Professor Howell and me. Professor Song will have an opportunity to respond if he wishes. And then we'll have another 15 to 20 minutes for questions and comments from the audience. And I will just interject here. Uh, after it's all said and done, please join us outside for <clears throat> what looks like a fabulous spread. Um, in the meantime, join me in welcoming Professor Guang Song, who will be speaking on thinking across disciplines, the ubiquity, usefulness, and limitations of computation. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for your kind words, Mark. Appreciate very much. I'm few. Very humbled by that. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Uh, how about I just meet, let me open up with a prayer. Um, Lord, we, we are immensely grateful to Lord, to come before you and to come together into your presence. And we pray, Lord, as we gather together in your name, you will be so unconscious of much grace and favor and understanding. Or we pray this, uh, this uh, our engagement here will bring much understanding of the matter before us. So we humbly ask you, give us wisdom, give us insight, give us enlightenment, both our minds and our hearts. We thank you and be with you. Thank you for coming. And so, today I will be speaking about computation, perhaps in the broadest sense. And uh, first, I would like to just to give some acknowledgement. I just saw my wife and my child come in. I'm so delighted to see them. 
Uh, in, and also, I'm just so glad for each of you who could choose to for the nation to come here. And I want to thank you all. And I, I feel our lives, you know, you all, other colleagues, my professors, you know, uh, in the past, our lives are knit together. And I feel this work is really not my work, but our work. So I want to thank you all. You all contribute in one way or another, supporting me in one way or another. So, and today, you know, what I'm presenting, I hope it's only a starter, a start of the conversation. And I, with the hope that I will hear back from you and your input and your thoughts so that we can have a better understanding. Uh, because it's, it's so magnificent and so complex. Can be. So, now, first, uh, let's take a look. What is a computation? Computation can be something, you know, come to my mind first, what is one plus one? That is a computation. It could also be a decision, you know, should I come to the lecture or not? Or it could be a inference. Does the patient's neck pain implies meningitis? Or it could be a state transition. Uh, given current, you, know, you all perhaps know well how to play Rubik's Cube. What do I, what's my best move here? And that all requires computation. Indeed, computation is everywhere. That's the word ubiquitous. You know, it is everywhere. And um, I was one small, I used abacus, that's way of doing computation. And I remember hearing the story about the 30 crawl you know how the crow will bring pebbles and, and because your water level is low and after dropping some pebbles into the jar, the water level rise, rise and it rose and the crow did a drink, not a drink. That's computation. And you probably have seen this in the in the in the bathroom and you put your hand here, <laughs> the hover come out and just the right line and perhaps feel shorter than with a knee. <laughs> Um, the thing over here, uh, the, um, the clock, sorry, wrong direction. Mm -hmm. um, the clock here is hitting track time. That's a mechanical system that's doing the computation. This, this gumball machine, this winding machine, but even over here, this is a picture of the curve, curve how you see the grass, the pine trees, the bird of paradise in the garden, the hummingbird, actually, a lot of computation is going on in there as well as I will tell you. Computation is your figure, it's everywhere. So, so first I want to um, uh, I want to introduce a simple model, um, a simple mathematical model for computation. And this was de developed, proposed by Turing, uh, Alan Turing, a British mathematician in 1936. It's just an abstract computational device. So let me just explain. So what I have here, you have something, it's a simple thing. I will explain to you. So you say you have a tape, and like in this example, tape has on it only zero or ones. And you have a head, a head, and this head can move to the left or to the right or stay in place. So currently the hat is at state zero. And then over here, this, this simple chart represents the state transition for the hat. So right now the hat is at state zero and it raised this number one. So, and then over here it specifies what the hat will do. It says this L says the hat will move to the left. You will move to the left over here and then you will replace this one with zero. That with that. So this is a cure machine. It's, based, it's, a, it's a computational, abstract computa computational device. It turns out this cure machine, this abstract model, can, have, can, can, represent, can, act, can represent all future computers, future mechanical computers. And so that's this is uh, a mathematical model. And we'll see that the reason I introduced this, we'll see it later, we'll see it. the other competition, they all fit in this model. 
And so yes, in that sense, they are all computations. Now let's consider um, more, just one more step more. What is computation? A computation is a transition from one state to another. And all computation require a sequence of small steps that takes you from one state to another. And it can be also in life, uh, every step development, such that of baby in the mother's womb, or here in this picture. And, it, and this development is an upstream move against the second law of thermodynamics. So it's intention, decision, and computation. It will not happen randomly, but there is a direction, as you can see. Uh, I, I will see more about this. Um, now, let's take a look. What is computation in the eyes of physicists? I studied physics before, and, and it turns out in the computation, a computer is just simply a circuit. It's, not, it's nothing more than a circuit. It's just a circuit. So, imagine we want to do 15 plus 8. This is how we do the computation 15 plus 8 using a circuit. So what do we do is so first we convert this 15 plus 8 to a binary number, a, a two base numbers. Numbers that are made of only zeros or, or ones. So this is all one. It turns out this number in binary is 15 in decimal. And this 1000 is just to do a measure. So we get, we grab a multimeter over here. You probably have seen this one, something like this. And we measured output, what kind of voltage information we have for kind of output. And if we do that, we find out it is H, L, H, H, H. And we turn that, we decode it, and it goes back to 10111. And then that's a binary number, we convert back to a decimal value, it turns out it is 23. So that's how a computer, how you can use a circuit to do 15 plus 8. For those of you who are in computer science 144, this is what you'll learn, uh, probably. Um, so, uh, where is doing the computation? It's only doing running the current. Um, and it's our interpretation and our, how we set up the circuit that makes the computation. Now, let's take a look of the usefulness of computation, how useful computation is. And I, in one phrase, I think computation is very useful because it, it extends the reach of our minds and our feet. Um, so here's, here's uh, let me explain why it extends the reach for our, our mind. And so this happens around 1900. In early 1900, actually it's about late 1800, we developed X-ray. And about in 1930s, we were able to purify, I mean scientists able to purify proteins and form crystals, or grow growth crystals. And then, at the time, we know if we shine X-ray onto the crystal, it will generate diffraction patterns. And then from the diffraction patterns, you can write down some mathematical equations, and, and then you know if you can solve it, you can determine the actual protein structure. So at the time, we have the physics ready for it. We, have the, we know how to represent this as a math problem. We know you can solve an important biology problem, but we do not have the computational resource to solve that big inverse problem. So it takes the development of computers, and then they come together and solve this important in inverse problem. And this led to the Nobel Prize in actually another field in chemistry in 1962. You see how all these fields, they come together. Now, Computation extend the reach of our feet as well. Uh, I, I just took this from Atlantic, 
And uh, let me just read this with you. It says, without the computers on board Apollo spacecraft, there would have been no moon landing, no triumphant first step, no high watermark for human space travel. A pilot could never have navigated the way to the moon as if a spaceship were simply a more powerful airplane. It is not. The calculations required to make in-flight adjustment and the complexity of the thrust control all stripped human capacity. But humans, we are, God give us the wisdom, we are intelligent enough, we know how to invent tools to do that. So we invent the computer, and with the type of computer, we are able to put our feet on them. So computer, the very useful, extend the reach of our mind, it extend the reach of our feet. And let's see more about computation. So this is even 20, over 20 years ago. Uh, this is from New York Times, and you have this uh, article about, uh, about, um, uh, about how all science is becoming computer science. It says, in fact, a research on so many fronts is becoming increasingly dependent on computation. All science, it seems, is becoming computer science. 2001. And then let's say what in 2004. In 2004, there are a number of schools uh, introducing CS plus X program. This was the program in the University of Illinois. So they have, let's see what they have. They have computer science plus animal science plus computer science plus crop science, education, bioengineering, physics, music, and so on. And uh, linguistics, philosophy, Geography, advertising, you name it. Computer Science Plus X program. And not only in Illinois, uh, Northwestern, another big university, they have this CX Plus X program. You know, they have robotics, education, psychology, art, medicine, literature, theory. I know, by the way, for some of those of you who are right now in the STEM major, but you still should become somebody from history, people are thank you for coming. I think perhaps this this uh, discussion here will help you consider to bring computation into your discipline, into what you do. So the, over here what it says the computer science plus X initiative at Northwestern University explores the possibilities of interdisciplinary research. Our goal is to foster transformational relationship between computer science and the intersecting fields and establish connections across the universe. So that's the computer science plus X program. Now, um, I do not need to say more about the next topic. You probably have seen you know, um, the impact of computation, that is artificial intelligence. Um, so here are a couple comments I want to make about artificial intelligence. So first is there is much information, much knowledge. Um, there is much knowledge that, that, that has been accumulated over the last century, many centuries. Um, and, and then so there's much hidden information stored in the knowledge accumulated. And so inference or reasoning by data is able to bring some of the hidden information out. And the large language model, such as ChatGPT, is one such example. So the, the LMMs, they find a way to represent word, context, grammar, and consequently are becoming a marvelous machine for generating text images upon prompting. And actually, Christy, have you made this poster over here? The poster you have seen? The poster was generated by AI. Not, not this, not this part. <laughs> <laughs> this part is real. I even make a shirt. <laughs> uh -huh. um, all right. So, no. Um, one more word, a few more words about AI. However, since knowledge is not precise, but probabilistic, it works best to act producing threats. So AI is best to producing 
some pretty much drugs. On the other hand, because information, good or evil, can be easily generated and made accessible, the use of AI must be regulated to prevent inappropriate access, misuse, or abuse of information. I want to move on to talk about another key hot topic, and that is, uh, that is quantum computing. Uh, quantum computing, quantum computers, it turns out they do not use circuits. Uh, they do not run on, in, you know, the, does not use the electrons to run them in the wires. The quantum computer, they use some other physical devices, such as trapped ions, superconducting wires, or neutral items trapped by laser. And they can, they use them because they can encode the inf information in quantum bits. Um, it's, so what is a quantum bit? It's just an entangled state. You, instead of being zero and one, you can have a quantum state that's being zero and one at the same time. And, and it's because of that, you can encode a lot more information. And so, so quantum computers become practical, it would alter how we do information instruction. Because using quantum computer, you can, you can, you can break the instruction very quickly even if you uh, use uh, uh, very long, even if you use, like right now, all the banking, internet, uh, information transfer are in script. But if you, can, if you have a quantum computer, it's possible to break those inscriptions. So here is just an update about the state art on quantum computing. IBM is doing this, uh, have this uh, uh, counter, which has about a thousand qubits, and item computing, that company has about something similar. And here's a quote from this source that some say that reaching 10,000 qubits is an important milestone because it will allow for the practical realization over 100 logical qubits. And this is essential for performing longer, more complex computations with a lower chance of errors. So when you design a quantum computer, you have, to, you have to worry about error correction. And you have spent a lot of bodies to do error correction. And so in order to really crack in the, uh, the RSA, the using banking and internet information in inscription, in order to crack RSA 2048, which 2048 bits, uh, you need 20 million bodies, or 4,000 bodies. So we are still a long way from there. Right now we can only do a thousand problems. All right, so um, at this point, I want to just move on to talk about molecular comp computing. So while the world is dazzled by what AI can do or may do what quantum computing may do, there's another, there's another type of computation quite going on around us that is, that is much more glorious and that has a much longer history, actually started since the foundation of the world. And that is the molecular computing going on inside of us, um, inside all life forms. So let's take a look here. And this is from Psalm 139. David said, for you form my inward, inward parts. You need me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I'm fearfully wanton made. Wonderful are your works, my soul knows very well. So this, um, so David, this is about, how many years ago? Three thousand years ago. So, 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 so he at that time he know there's something very complex about his birth, about his formation, his his mother's womb. And uh, uh, let me talk more, more about this knitting. You some people may have attend. There was a uh, a play or a reading of this Ida engine. Ida is uh, a lady who loves the idea of 
of the, the possibility of a future machine that can make music or something like that. And actually, Ada is a friend of Charles Babbage. Babbage. And Charles Babbage is the person who invented the first computer. And actually, the story does not, uh, it has, the story, there's something before that. Some, so, Charlie Bag Babbage actually learned the idea of using punch card from another person called Joseph Mary ja Jack Jackwar. Joseph Mary Maria Jackwar, he used punch card, like this what this lady is doing in this picture. He used punch card to instruct an automatic room to need complex pattern. So, and so Charlie Babbage later on applied that idea and designed the computer, his computer, his idea of computer. But the, 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 the idea of using punch cards was initially from Jaguar. Now, um, I want to say this here, I want to dwell on this slide for a little bit because I, I, I love what's on this slide and I want to take this slow. The first I want to say, repeat some um, not 139, how David says you need me together in my mother's room. I want to tell you a story, or not a story, there's something happened to me. My mom, he, she, uh, she's, right now she's 83, well, living, healthy, and I, you know, she has been so much to me. So she has been, need, she has been needing, you know, over the past many years, many sweaters for me and my siblings. And so, she would need sweaters for us, one stitch at a time. A regular sweater takes about 2,000, 20,000 stitches. And I bring one to show you. There's some issues. So over here, this one is not a, like, a, with, does not have a sleeve. But, so this is a sweater she made, and uh, she, she made. So you, on the back, it says 20 stitches. But in the front, there are all kinds of patterns. And you can see, uh, you can take a closer look afterwards. So, so here's the thing about my mother and my dad. They do not ask, they do not know how, how they do not know about computers or computer programs. And they ask me, well, what is what you are doing? What is computer program? Mm -hmm. I did not know. But one thing about my mom, she is an excellent programmer. She would think she's an excellent programmer. She knows how to need, need me. It's programming. You have to be precise at each move. This is programming. Um, and so, and uh, um, uh, over here, now back to Joseph Jaguar. His automatic room used punch cards to program, to program complex. And now let's take a look at us, ourselves. Our bodies, indeed, our life forms, are knitted together by an automatic molecular loop, cell by cell, tissue by tissue, organ by organ, through molecular program. A newborn baby has about 1.25 trillion cells knitted together. And our creator knows how to program and how to orchestrate all the cells harmoniously to do his duty to form complex organs and satisfies her brain. This is a sum. A sum. Now. now let's uh, a closer look of this process. Um, in Genesis 2, it says, Then the Lord God formed men of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostril the breath of life, and the men become a living creature. So this is the creation account of Adam and Eve. So God made Adam from dust. And um, I cannot, I, I can hardly imagine in the presence of a kind of host, that must be such a, such a stunning, such an amazing. 
work, right? When, when they see how God often does make Adam. And Adam such an amazing creature, an amazing handiwork of God. And actually not only Adam, if we consider all the animals God made, they are you know they have, have you know their own uniqueness and the unique beauties, unique features, and and they all have eyes and see, ears and hear, they have mind and have reason. So, so the work, the design of God's creation is stunning. And then God said that. And then God said, and God blessed them. And God said, be fruitful and multiply, multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let the birds multiply on earth. Genesis 1, 22. So God asked them to, to fruitful, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. But how? Uh, so here, Genesis 3, 20, 20 says, the man called his wife named Eve because she was the mother of all men. So, God decided that the rest of mankind not be made from God directly, but born through Eve. But how could you grow a man? How could you grow a man from a single cell? Is that possible? Is that real life? An even more difficult question is, you know, how do you realize it? What is the molecular pathway? I think in the in the pro at the time, that's my imagination of the pro So, so I think even all the chemicals, all the animals, they do not know how could how could the 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 rest of animals can be modified and filtered without being made because the process really much is is amazing, right? It's very, and I will show you. So, so, so what I think, this, this making, making all the, so I go back to this line here. So I go back to this line over here. God says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the sea and let birds multiply on earth. How could that talk? Imagine you do not know about reproduction. You have never heard about reproduction. And you, and God says, be fruitful and multiply. How, how would you imagine that could be possible? That, that one person could reproduce another person, one animal could reproduce another animal. That reproduction itself is is very So, um, let's go back to here. Um, so, so I guess what I'm trying to say is this is um, this is the the reproduction, how to the realization process. If if, if the design agony. If the design of all the animals is amazing. The structure design, you know, how we have eyes and see, our inner ears, middle ears, our ears can hear, the design is amazing. But equally amazing is the, the molecular design of our body. So that our body can reproduce, you know, um, the, 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 the human being can reproduce itself. A chessboard has 32 pieces. Grandmasters or the AI stockfish can see about 15 to 20 moves ahead. A newborn baby has about 1.25 trillion cells achieved through that many number cell division. In designing the molecular program that leads from a fertilized cell to a newborn, God thought through the whole problem. Trillion cells and cells. You know, when I, when, I, when I consider all this, I cannot help agree with the psalmist. The psalmist is from Psalm 92. He said, How great I work the Lord. Your thoughts are very good. The thoughts of God are very good.
itself. So God employed molecular computation using basic molecules to realize reproduction. We just applied. And in doing this, God concealed his glory in creation. Instead, for us to see God making the first item, we would we really not see God make the first item the, the, the person from God. We would see just reproduction. So in doing so, God concealed his glory in creation. Over time, the reproduction seems commonplace in the eyes of man. But we have to realize that it takes an equal amount of glory to conceal that glory in the creation of Adam. Proverbs 25, 2 says, It is the glory of God to conceal man. And it's the glory of kings to search them out. The concealed glory, uh, here I want to give you one example about the concealed um, glory. And this is uh, taken from a well trusted uh, textbook, molecular biology of the cell. Probably every school that teaches molecular biology even gets the textbook. That's all well trusted. And this is what it says. Uh, it says, the central trend of neural development is to explain how the axons and the dendrites belong. These are the things each neuron cell goes on. The axons and dendrites find their right partners and synapse with them selectively to create a functional network. The problem is form, uh, it's, uh, form, uh, formidable. The human brain contains about 100 billion neurons, each of which, on average, has to make connections with about a thousand others, according to a regular critical wire pattern. No one knows how that one actually What do we know? There is a molecular program driving to form that brain, to do that. All this are achieved through molecular programming without external intervention. Let's take another look uh, of something else. Sometimes when we see, pay attention, we see God's glory. Uh, just, uh, you know, like uh, in, in, a, in a spectacular way. So here, over here, this is a fruit fly. And on the wings of the fruit fly, there are two ant patterns. You can see the ants look very real. So, God is able to need design this fly so that the beings have to shoot at and God, our creator, knows what we need. And indeed, you know, if you think about every living creature, it's a miracle as a worker program at work. Consider all those seeds. You know, there are different kinds of seeds here. Inside every seed, there is a unique worker program. And every seed, when you put them in the earth, every seed has a mission. And that's to become what it's supposed to become. Whether it's a palm tree, or a corn, or a canal, every seed has a mission. It has, and you will, you will be driven by the molecular program to become what it should become. Because both the body, each plant has a body in plant. And you will realize. Um, so summary about these three types of computation. We have electrical computing, and we have using electrons, and then we have, you know, can do arithmetic cal 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 calculations, complete chess, AI. We have quantum computing promise, pro that promises faster computations, especially factor. And we have molecular computation using more is the media. Instead of using electrons or ions, using all kinds of molecules. And this kind of realized all life forms. So indeed, this is the most glorious among all kinds of For surpass all the other conditions. 
Now I would like to talk about a few more minutes about um, the limitation of, of computations. Uh, so, so first, that, that computational theory tells us that there exist certain problems that are unsolved computationally, that, that you will not reach, that your problem will not stop. You run a program, the program will not stop. So you cannot solve it computationally. And then there are other programs, problems that are solvable, but intractable, which means all known solutions are very, very slow. You do not have a fast solution. They take a long time to solve. And then there is another dimension of limitation, and that is since computation is information processing, uh, confirmation, computation cannot trans transcend itself. In other words, self awareness cannot be achieved through computation. So, um, now, really, who are we? Are we just who are we? So, I think, I think we are more than other questions of self, a question of home. And it says, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostril. This is very key the bread life. So God not only made men from the dust, he also breathed into them, breathed life into them. And then the man become, became a living creature. Um, now I want to say a few words on consciousness. Our physical body, made of cells, made of molecules, they are, they are complex, they are marvelous, but however marvelous it is, it's only all said the whole process is only a tank. It's only a tank. A tank for our inner being. Life is not just about computation. And in another place, Jesus says it's the spirit, the spirit that gives life. And we are alive not because our heart is pumping, but also because we have the spirit, breath of life. Uh, this is my last slide. Um, it's my desire that that uh, uh, this will um, this will stir up some some um, some some thoughts, some thinking about the matter. And I would, so I would like to. I would hope that you would walk away in awe to consider that the creativity of our Chinese God. You know, consider the, the hummingbird or the bird of the plant, the bird of, par par of paradise. Indeed, there's a miracle at every turn. And if you take a walk on canvas, at every turn, there is a miracle there. There is a stunning molecular program at work. Inside every life more runs a molecular program. And then secondly, um, I want to uh, express the point that computation is useful. It extends the reach of our mind and the feet. Uh, consider, for those of you who have not taken any class on computation before, I teach CS10, so can consider teaching Python from CS10 with me. Or if you have taken CS10, consider taking CS Biology 106, Computational Biology with me, that I will teach next fall. Uh, lastly, I want to say that computation is limited. There's another kind of knitting going on, another kind of knitting that is of a much greater scale. Uh, Apostle Paul says in his letter to the Colossians is that their hearts may be encouraged being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the wisdom and understanding and knowledge. So that concludes my talk. Um, thank you for your attention. We will now have brief comments uh, from Professor Howell and myself, but we will begin with Professor Howell.
Where is Professor Son? Thank you very much for your interesting lecture. And also I'd like to thank posthumously Paul Wilt, for whom this lecture series is named. In the early days of the series, his financial contributions were key in sustaining it. So out of his own pocket, he sustained them. Um, I only have 10 minutes for this talk, so let's get right to it. It will consist of two parts, um, three parts. Uh, I want to expound a bit on some things that Professor Song said throughout his lecture, especially at the end, <clears throat> connect that with some opinions I have about computation, and then ask Professor Song two questions. Now, throughout his lecture, Professor Song used the word algorithm. Understanding what we mean by an algorithm is fundamental to understanding what a computer can do. So it's important to understand the term, especially as it relates to the limitations of computer science. So an algorithm, according to the Stanford professor of computer science, Donald Knuth, comes from the word algorithm, which is the process of doing arithmetic of, with Arabic numerals. It was in the book that he wrote called Rules of Restoration and Reduction, and the mathematician was Abu Jafar Muhammad Ibn Musa al-Khwarizmi. As a bonus for coming to this talk today, restoration in the title is really the Arab word al-Jabbar. Algebra is the process where you move one symbol from one side of the equation to another. That's what algebra is. You restore it. So you move that minus 7 to the other side and you get 10. And algebra is where we get our word algebra. So you can share that with all your friends at the DC tonight over lunch. Now an algorithm is, the, is a finite, unambiguous, effective procedure or a recipe or a set of rules for performing a task. You saw in Professor Song's interesting slide a Turing machine. Every practicing scientist, computer science today, subscribes to what's known as the Church Turing thesis. And that is this, that the formal instantiation mathematically of a Turing machine captures informally what we mean by an algorithm, a finite, unambiguous, effective procedure. Finite means the list of steps is just finite, doesn't go on forever. Effective means we can actually do what the algorithm says. Um, unambiguous means that the instructions are clear. There is no different possible interpretation to those instructions. In 1931, the logician Kurt Gödel proved an interesting theorem. And it was um, taken up in 1961 by the Oxford philosopher John Lucas. I'll talk a little bit about what Gödel did and then what Lucas did and how that relates to the limitations of computation. So this looks very technical, but essentially what Gödel proved was that if you formalize arithmetic that it is limited. And here's the exact symbols that Gödel used, and it translates, if there exists some state statement or sequence of statements Y, for which there is no demonstration, then this statement at the bottom, I need my um, pointer I left on my... magnifying glass, then this statement right here, if there is anything that can't be proved, this statement can't be proved. Now, to say that something can't be proved is essentially saying that your system is consistent, because in an inconsistent system, everything can be proved. And what Gödel said essentially is, if arithmetic is consistent, then this statement can't be proved. That's essentially what he says there. If you have a consistent arithmetical system, there are statements that can't be proved or disproved. And he even showed that the consistency of arithmetic 
is one such statement that the statement arithmetic is consistent can't be proved. In other words, we mathematicians can't have our cake and eat it too. We would like arithmetic to be consistent, but we will not be able to prove that it is consistent if it is consistent. And let's call that statement G, just for the sake of argument. So statement G, this very, this very statement cannot be proved or disproved. Result, if G can be proved, so can not G. Those were the things that Gödel showed. And this is the title of his paper. So um, John Lucas has an, an, an interesting um, spin-off of this theorem. And um, to understand what he says, let's imagine that a Turing machine capable that someone claims to be intelligent and can understand and simulate human thought in its fullest uh, form arrives at the border for entry into the USA, which we will call the United States of Analytical Minds. And the Turing machine wants to pass the test of being a human. So the immigration official says this, do you know whether the statement G derived from your own rule governed system is true? I should say, by the way, that one of the things that Gödel proved was, not only does this statement G apply to arithmetic, but to any formal system that's powerful enough that would include a system that claims to be able to think like a human does. So do you know whether your statement G derived from your own rule governed system is true? So wanting to get into the country, the person might say, the Turing machine might say, well, yes. But then the Turing machine is rejected because if you can prove your consistency, then you are inconsistent. What happens if the Turing machine answers no? Then, according to John Lucas, since we know that statement G is true, the Turing machine is rejected because it is not up to our own rational truth-seeking standards. It's this statement right here that John Lucas wanted to tease out. This statement says of itself that I can't be proved. But if arithmetic is consistent, then this statement says the truth, namely that it can't be proved. And according to Lucas, we can see arithmetic is consistent because we're not limited to finite procedures. And he quotes someone as working out an infinite system of rules that demonstrate the consistency of arithmetic. It's that point that I had a little issue with him that began a sequence of email exchanges that led to him inviting my wife and me to his home in Somerset, England. And I think this was in the summer of 2004. Uh, his wife, Mora, is right on the left there. John Lucas was a big bear of a man. He unfortunately passed away in 2000. And he fixed a marvelous spread for us. And I, so during the, during the dinner time, I raised my objections to his work. And I must say, I left with my head spinning. After all, he's a philosopher, I'm not. And boy, was he smart. But to alleviate my conundrum, as, as you should say, he gave us a ride in his 1927 Humber, which is a car that was handed to him by his father. And uh, just a little picture of what the ride was like. It takes about 20 seconds to go through. I stopped the camera just before a truck was coming the other way. You can imagine what my anxiety was when we saw the truck right about right after that occurred. All right, well, Professor Song uh, <laughs> concluded his lecture, he didn't confuse his lecture, with these slides. We're not a collection of molecules and so on. The spirit is what gives light. So I would like, let me go back one. Um, so th this issue of proving that we are not machines, I'm not convinced with Lucas's argument. But I have an intuition 
that we are not. I don't think God is a Turing machine. And these slides that Professor, Swan, uh, Swan, <laughs> Professor Song showed us illustrate the, be, the image bearers of God that we are. And if God is not a Turing machine and we're his image bearers, I think it very unlikely that we are Turing machines. Does that show up in the scriptures at all? Well, I think that to be creative involves thinking non-algorithmically. When you think back to the uh, Genesis account, one of the things that God said was, name the animals. Till the garden, those are creative acts. I don't see any algorithm in there that they were to use to do that kind of work. And this is the kind of intuition that I think that most mathematicians have. The next slide I wanna show you is a comment that Andrew Wiles made on the, on the PBS video Nova. And it was made right after he proved Fermat's last theorem, which was a conjecture that had stymied mathematicians for over 350 years. And he solved it, and here's what he says about it. I never use a computer. I sometimes write scribble, I do doodles. I start trying to to find patterns, really. So I'm doing calculations which try to explain some little piece of mathematics. Um, and I'm trying to fit it in with some previous broad conceptual understanding of some branch of mathematics. Sometimes that'll involve going and looking up in a book to see how it's done there. Um, sometimes it's a question of modifying things a bit. Sometimes doing a little extra calculation. And sometimes you realize that nothing that's ever been done before is any use at all. And you, you just have to find something completely new. And it's a mystery where it comes from. Note that last line. It's a mystery where that comes from. Now, of course, Wiles also said, sometimes it involves looking at a book and seeing what others have done. To paraphrase Isaac Newton, sometimes you need to stand on the shoulders of giants. But sometimes it's a mystery where it comes from. And I would suggest that that's sort of the essence of creativity. It's being able to think out of the box, being able to think not like a Turing machine, being able to think non-algorithmically. Let me close with two questions for Professor Song. First, do you agree that creativity may well be something that cannot be fully modeled by an algorithm? I don't think, as I said, that God is a Turing machine. The second is this. Do you agree with me that someday it will not be possible for computers to replace people? That is, that we will not be able ever to have a th machine that thinks exactly as a human does. We might be able to simulate thinking to a great degree. Humans can't fly, but we can simulate flying. Is that analogy sufficient to say that computers can simulate thinking, or do you think there's a limitation, an, a fundamental limitation there? And uh, finally, uh, I save this because I want to build up to the last comment. Um, a lot of people often ask me whether I am afraid that computers will get so smart that they will replace people. Computers will become like people. My response is usually, usually this, and Professor Song, I wonder if you agree. It is not the prop, the danger is not that computers will replace people or become like people. The greater danger is that people will become like computers. To the extent that we have bought into cultural patterns that we don't question, to the extent that we are just blindly following rule-governed procedures and not being creative, maybe it's happening to us already. The danger is that if we become like computers, we'll lose our personhood. I'm very grateful, Professor Swang, that your wife was able to be here today. Unfortunately, mine had an appointment downtown that she could not get out of. She's going to ask me how many people came. So now she'll know.
Thank you, Wang Kong, for that informative, eye-opening, and thought-provoking lecture, and for your invitation to comment on it. I'm going to go straight to do something that philosophers love to do, and that is to make a distinction. The distinction I wish to make is between three levels of description or explanation. Back in the 1970s and 80s, several philosophers and computer scientists, including Daniel Dennett, David Marr, and Zenon Pilishin, proposed that the behavior of certain systems, such as chess-playing computers, could be understood on multiple levels, and that these levels are largely separate and self-contained. They characterized these three levels in slightly different terms and gave them different names, but they tended to converge on something like the following. The most basic level is the physical level. This is the behavior uh, at, at this level, the behavior of the machine can be understood in terms of what the electrons, for instance, are doing at certain um, moments and places in the circuits of the hardware. Then there's the program level. The behavior of the machine can be understood in terms of the algorithms given to it in machine language by its coders. Then there's the intentional level. The behavior of the machine can be understood in terms of what problems its program is meant to solve. Uh, in this case, the computer is trying to win a chess game by attacking my king with its queen and bishop in a scholar's mate gambit. And notice these are separate and self-contained levels, according to Dennett and Marr, because I can understand perfectly well what's going on at a higher level without knowing anything at all about what's going on at the lower level. When I'm trying to understand why white has moved its queen to h5, I do not need to know anything about electrons or algorithms. All I need to know is that white can now threaten f7 with the bishop on c4. Uh, and this sheds light on the main question I have for Professor Song. So on to that question. To me, one of the most intriguing parts of Professor Song's talk was also the shortest, and that was his discussion of the limits of computation. And he says that, that there are intrinsic limits. Uh, and so uh, uh, there are certain problems that are unsolvable computationally. So I would like to hear more about that. Um, this talk of intrinsic limits and comments like the ones that Professor Russ Howell um, raised make me wonder in a very loose and impressionistic way whether ultimately computers will be able to do all the things that humans are able to do and to do them as well as humans can do. Uh, I have to admit that part of me, the old-fashioned humanist part of me, hopes that the answer is no, but fears in my worst moments that it might be yes. Partly this fear grows out of my desire to defend my belief in human uniqueness, that human beings are unique, special, valuable in ways that some other things are not. One way to do this would be to show that there are things that humans can do that machines cannot do. And so part of me casts about then to find something that makes humans unique, something that not even the smartest computer can do. But I have to say the track record for this sort of argument is not great. The problem is that very often when someone says, here's something that computers will never be able to do, in a few short years, when someone builds a, uh, then someone will build a computer that can do that thing. It's a bit like the old God of the gaps problem. When some Christians came to think that they needed proofs for God's existence in order for their belief to be um, epistemologically upstanding, they cast it about to find things that science could not explain and that could only be explained by God. Whether this was the rising and setting of the sun, the wonderful fit between animals and the ecosystems they live in, the occurrence of solar eclipses, and so on. Now, science has not explained everything, but over time it has explained more and more of those things. So the gaps in what science can explain, seem to keep shrinking. And if God lives only in the gaps, then the case for God shrinks as the gaps shrink. So, 
Some people confidently proclaim that a computer could never beat a grandmaster at chess. But then in 1997, a computer called Deep Blue finally beat uh, Garry Kasparov. And one more supposed gap in what computers could do was eliminated. So I think a human uniqueness of the gaps approach makes human value a hostage to fortune, and so we should avoid it. Now, at the risk of immediately falling back into the error I've just warned you about, let me float one more idea about something that maybe humans can't do. No, uh, sorry, that computers can't do, even with AI, or can't do as well as humans. And that is to exercise <clears throat> practical wisdom. Practical wisdom is something that philosophers and theologians have known about for thousands of years. English speakers of the modern era called it prudence. The ancient Greeks called it phronesis and regarded it as one of the cardinal virtues, meaning that it was impossible to lead a good and blessed life if you did not have it. According to Aristotle, for example, practical wisdom is the character trait that enables us to deliberate well about what to do in particular circumstances. Sometimes this is simply a matter of reasoning according to the rules, but sometimes it isn't. First, this is partly because of the uniqueness and infinite complexity of our daily lives and their particular circumstances, which can only be known by experience. And knowledge of particulars, says Aristotle, requires experience. Uh, this is why he states that Although the young may be experts in geometry and mathematics and similar branches of knowledge, we do not consider that a young person can have prudence. So an interesting thing. So there are child prodigies in mathematics. There are not child prodigies in morality or practical wisdom. What the practically wise person, the phronimos, knows uh, in these cases is which features of our moral circumstances out of the welter of features vying for our attention are relevant or salient. There's no finite set of finite rules about which facts are salient in the infinite array of possible circumstances. So the wisdom of the practically wise person, the phronimos, is more like a sort of discernment or vision than it is like following rules. Second reason, it's partly because we're subject to a plurality of moral rules or duties. And in the event of a conflict between them, we need to know which rule or duty outweighs the others. What the phronomos knows in these cases is which rules out of the many that might potentially apply to us is the most relevant or has priority. And there just isn't one, one size fit fits all master rule that tells us how to rank competing rules. So again, the wisdom of the phronimos is more like discernment or vision than it is like applying a rule about how to apply rules. And sometimes it's partly because in our ethical thinking, there are cases where there simply are no rules or the rules break down. Aristotle says that something like this shows up in law and politics too. Uh, in his discussion of the just versus the equitable, Aristotle points out that a legal decision rendered according to the law will be just in the narrow sense, the narrow legal sense, but it is not necessarily equitable or just in the broader overall moral sense. And so we need equity, which is a correction of legal justice. And he says the reason we need this is that all law by its nature is universal, and this is a quote, but about some things it is not possible to make a universal statement which shall be correct. Um, I'm gonna set aside legal matters right now and consider a more mundane sort of example. Um, this is one that I share with my students all the time. Suppose I've ridden my bicycle to work the last thing I did before I left home this morning was to promise that I would be home by five o'clock. Suppose I'm now on my way home and I'm on track to be home at about five o'clock on the dot. 
About five minutes out, I see the cyclist ahead of me in the bike lane wipe out. What should I do? So we'll freeze the action here. Um, according to Oxford philosopher and Aristotle scholar, W.D. Ross, I now have a duty of beneficence to help the cyclist, as well as a duty of fidelity to keep my promise to be home by 5 p.m. Given the facts of the case, I can't satisfy them both. If I stop and help the cyclist, I will be late. If I make it home on time, that'll only be because I cycled past and ignored her. Ethically, what ought I to do? I do not have a rule that tells me what to do in such cases. And there is no true general rule that duties of beneficence always outweigh duties of fidelity or vice versa. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Ross advises that we must make use of a sort of intuition. And I was really pleased with Professor Howell's use of that word here. Here's what Ross says. I must study the situation as fully as I can until I form the considered opinion or intuition that the circumstances, uh, that in those circumstances, one of those duties is more incumbent than any other. He's saying you have to use phronesis. Now, my students are sometimes puzzled by this. They think this is just way too dicey. Um, uh, and so I ask them, if you were in a situation like that, what additional information would you want to have? And after a pause, almost immediately, raising their hand, they wonder, how badly is the cyclist hurt? Uh, is there anyone else around who saw her fall? How much first aid do you, Nelson, know? Um, do you have a cell phone on you? To whom did you make your promise this morning? What were the circumstances? Was it a solemn promise or just a kind of casual prediction? Why do you need to be home at 5 p.m. anyway? Is it to take somebody to a doctor's appointment? Uh, or is it just to watch reruns of Everybody Loves Raymond? Um, was this promise to your spouse, for example? And what is the state of your relationship with her? None of your business. But um, have, you, have you let her down a lot lately? Have you broken some promises lately? Um, all of these things matter. Now, my students are able to do this very quickly and spontaneously with no coaching, um, but they're not able to do it because they are applying rules or algorithms. They are able to do this because they've had enough life experience to understand my circumstances here, what it would be like for them to be in those circumstances, and they know the morally salient particulars to look for and how these interact with each other. That is, they have a holistic, creative, quasi-perceptual insight that is an application of practical wisdom and not algorithms. But since computers run on algorithms, this leads me to my question. Maybe there can be artificial intelligence, but can there be artificial wisdom? I have more to say, but I think I'm going to end on that note. Thank you. And uh, I will make some short remarks and then I'll be happy to give you a chance to ask questions or share some thoughts. <clears throat> so, um, so first thing that I, the scripture says this body, this brain is a head. Our true being is our inner being, our soul. So, so that's important for me to know is, is this is it's not essential. What's more essential is our being not being this is attack. And another thing is, is that we have a wisdom of a credibility. And here's what scripture says, Proverbs 2. It says, for the Lord is wisdom. And he's from his mouth, come knowledge and understanding. It's a Lord who leads by. It's we, we have, we can, we can do things, but our, a lot of our thought is inspiration from God. So, so here's what I see artificial intelligence. The 
I think to me, a better word for artificial intelligence really is imparted intelligence. So what can artificial intelligence, what computer can do, are all designed by us. We are a tool that extends the reach of mind and feet. So artificial intelligence is, they just carry out something we program to do. So it has, it's a given part of the They intend this, we impart onto them, and they have a greater power, greater memory, so they can produce something that's kind of amazing. But still, everything is a part from us. We are the source of everything that we are. We impart it. And then they realize that there are things we cannot impart. Such as, my like Paul says to the, to the church in Ephesus, he says, Now, since they heard about you, your, your, your faith in the Lord Jesus, your love for the Holy Spirit, we do not cease to give thanks to you, remember you in your first, that God may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him. So, those things are from God. We, he impart to us a wisdom, a spirit of wisdom, of a revelation, of knowledge. We cannot impart that to a computer because it's not for us. We do not know how. How can we impart it? We can be a recipient of that higher wisdom and understanding, but we do not know how to impart it. We know we can impart our thinking, but there is something greater we cannot impart. So that's how I see computer will never replace it. Um, they can do something amazing, like winning a chess game, but not to the point about uh, you know uh, a greater um, the, you know, the things belong to the, to the spirit belongs to 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 um, let me read you another text here from the scripture. It's from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And now there's um, this open for all persons from me. The last verse here. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says, um, <coughs> You are right fit for the same spirit. You are right services for the same Lord. And there are already activities of the same God who we empower on them all in everyone. And to some is given the manifestation of so uh, and, and to each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. To one is given through the spirit the utterance of wisdom. To the other, the utterance of knowledge. To another, faith, to another, the gift of healing, and so on. And all that is from the Spirit. So I want to do this. So, okay.